This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. What's up, everyone? Welcome to On the Market. I'm Dave Meyer, joined today by James Daynard. James, what's going on, man? We're just up in Seattle dealing with the cold. I got snow on the ground a little bit. It's 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 chilly. Seriously? I'm missing my palm trees in California. Doesn't it never snow there? Yeah, we get that wet, cold snow that's just everything slushy and and you know, exactly what kind of snow you it's like a snow cone, basically. We got a snow cone in the streets. That sounds miserable. Yeah. Well, hopefully we're going to, James and I and the rest of the on the market team are going to be in Denver next week hanging out. Um, so hopefully we'll get some better weather there. Usually it's nice in Denver, even, even in the winter, it's at least sunny. Oh yeah. I like Denver. Denver's the few times I went, I, I love that city. You got sun and cold that, that works. Just the, the wet cold's no good for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And we are, it's, it's going to be nice. And we're, we're going to be doing a meetup with bigger pockets. Um, by the time this comes out, it'll probably be too late to actually attend that meetup, but bigger pockets is doing a bunch more meetups this year. So definitely check that out. We post them on Instagram and on the website. I know there's one in Salt Lake city, uh, coming up in March. So if you are in that area or want to join a bigger pockets meetup, you can definitely do that today for this episode, James and I have the third part interview with Ben Miller, who is the CEO of Fundrise. Uh, We have him back, you might remember, right around the new year, we did a show with him called The Great Deleveraging, which is fascinating, just talking about liquidity issues in the banking system. Uh, We also had a great conversation with him about build to rent. This episode honestly went in a direction I did not (laughs) expect. We usually plan out, you know, the questions we're going to ask, and this just totally went in a different direction, but I thought it was a fascinating conversation. Oh, it was really fascinating. And it, it's, it gets a little bit complex, but at the same time, it's that core same principles of evaluating, predicting, making sure you're not sitting on the sidelines and spreading things out just so you, you, you know, as long as you predict and you underwrite correctly, you can invest in any market is really still what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really cool. So basically, we tried to ask Ben like what he thought was going to happen with the economy. And he was basically said, that's a bad way to think about it. You should be planning for different scenarios and basing your decisions on the different scenarios that can happen. And so he sort of walks us through how he thinks about scenario planning and how you can make real estate decisions based on these scenarios. And as James said, just as like, as a warning, there are some, he does talk about some investing options that are complicated. I honestly didn't know all all of the stuff he was talking about. Neither did I. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it's just if you get a little confused by some of the terms he uses right at the end, it's just for like three minutes. Um, it, uh, we we were a little bit too, but the, the rest of the episode is just like fascinating. I just love the idea of thinking probabilistically, planning different scenarios and making it just helps you make confident decisions. If you like think through all the different things that happen and stop like pretending that you know what's going to happen because none of us really do. Yeah, there's always that one guy said, I told you so. Yeah. They- <laughs> Yeah, like, of course. I, you know, I was guilty. I remember in 2018, people were like, you keep saying the market's going to come down. You've been saying that now for four years. And it becomes this like cry wolf thing. <laughs> but it's like, they're like, well, if the market comes down, we're not giving you any credit. It's been too long. Yeah, you need to you, need, you need add like a, a time frame to those predictions. Like the market's going to come down in a year or in the next six months. Yeah, corner. Yeah, eventually, like they like they say, like the broken clock is right twice a day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, well, let's get into it because this is we had a really long conversation, but it's great. Definitely stick around and listen to this conversation with Ben Miller, who's the CEO of Fundrise. But first, we're going to take a quick break. Ben Miller, welcome back to On the Market. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, in previous episodes, when you've joined us, we've talked a lot about real estate. We had a great show about deleveraging and we've talked a lot about rent to own. But today, given what's going on in the world, we'd love to just pick your brain a little bit about the macroeconomic climate. So I know that's a very broad topic, but we'd love to just get a sense of like your read on what's happening with the U.S. economy right now. Well, so that is a very tough question. <laughs> so, well, I'm just going think... to let you talk for 45 minutes. Yeah, we want to so st- want to state of the union on the economy right now. James and I are yeah. going to leave, and you just take you carry this entire podcast for us. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, let, let me just let me just start with this. Are you bullish or bearish on the U.S. economy right that right now? How about that? Yeah, it, it's it's funny because I feel like not only are we having this question, but everybody is, which is so normally internally we have sort of strong conviction for one way or the other. And I think generally what happens is that the, the market has conviction about something and then it consistently gets over, over um, extrapolates that conviction. Like there's like, it gets over, overbought. And that has happened like, man, pretty consistently in my career. And so then we're usually contrarian to that because it's, it's essentially like the market sort of gets momentum around an idea that is probably uh, something they want to be true, but not necessarily true. But at the moment, I don't feel like I have a strong conviction one way or the other. I mean, I think I think almost nobody I know does. We're in this place where we should be in a recession. We're not in a recession. The the market and the economy is kind of waiting on pins and needles for something to happen, and uh, and nothing has. And at some point, people start saying, "Well, no, maybe nothing will." Yeah, it's it's super confusing. You you said you just said that. You know, we should be in a recession. And I think that is like a prevailing belief. What makes you think, you know, that we should be in a recession right now? Just the tightening, like the monetary tightening that's going on? Yeah. I mean, just to take the idea that Charlie Munger has, which is when you're trying to apply your, you know, reasoning to, a, a, or if you're trying to, think through a problem, you know, you can try the inverse of the problem, like flip it over, inverse it and see what the inverse looks like. And then you come back to the one you're looking at. So if you flipped it over and said, okay, you know, what if interest rates were really low and what if they're doing quantitative easing, like printing a lot of money and we, and we know what that looks like, right? Yeah, we know that see, looks like a, that <laughs> game a few times. <laughs> yeah. We know that's like prices go up and the economy gets hot and there's inflation and all these things that we, we've just seen. So now the policy book, the policy playbook they're running is the opposite, right? Interest rates are really high and they're doing quantitative tightening, which is they're, they're, they're burning money. They're just like, they sell their assets off their balance sheet and then they eliminate the money. And that, should be having the opposite effect on the economy, which is that it's a recession. It's a down. Prices go down, right? Not that NASDAQ went up 11% so far this year. I saw a great guy from Odd Lots, Joe Weisenthal, like he's put it perfectly. He's like, we're seeing it in practice, right? But we can't figure out how it works in theory. That's so, yeah, it's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, like, so we know we're... That just inspires so little confidence. Like we we know what's happening, but we have absolutely no idea why, why it's happening. But it it makes sense, right? Yeah, like everyone would think that we'd be in a recession, or at least you know the labor market would have cracked a little bit by now, or something would start pointing in that direction. Do you have any you know speculation or thoughts on what is holding the economy together right now? Yeah. In situations like this, we have a practice internally, which is called scenario planning, which is a structured approach to um, forecasting. I've been doing it for years. I mean, I, I read this book in probably 2000 by this guy named Peter Schwartz. He wrote it. It's called Long-Term Scenario Planning. And it's some it's a, it's a business practice of how you do rigorous forecasting, right? And that he is a great book and there's a, is a great chapter in the book. He was involved with Shell and Shell Oil ran this practice with him and I think in the room back in like, God, it must be like 1986 or seven. They were sort of trying to figure out what was going to happen in oil markets. And they said, like they ran into this and the scenario planning process he recommends, which I also basically recommend is that when you, you know, we try to think through the future, there's like, you have to move to multiple scenarios. And so having like, like what's, what's going to happen is like, you're asking the wrong question. You, you, you want to have sort of different scenarios and you want these scenarios to be different, con to be contrasted because you want to get your mind out of this idea of a fixed future and work and think probabilistically. And so the scenario structure he recommends are, you know, basically a natural extrapolation of the present into the future which is generally their their sort of cognitive bias that we pursue that we fall into. We think about the future as if it's more of the same 
And that's like, it's because of the way we, we perceive time as a sort of continuity. And that's like useful to sort of say, okay, well, like, let's just play it out. Actually, let's do the work and really play this out, put some time into it. And then the other scenario you would naturally do would be like, okay, things get a lot worse. Things break. There's like a negative, a negative scenario. And then the third scenario would be something strange or unexpected. And the point of the scenario planning is not necessarily that you're right about any one of those things, but it's basically to, it gets you much more prepared. You're, you're looking for certain indicators in the market in a way that you weren't looking for them before. So you're able to move sort of faster or you may change some of the things you're doing. You say, oh, well, like if this thing happened, it would be a disaster for us. So let's like fix this thing ahead of time. So it just gets you in a much better position and so it's a, it's just a it's a better way to approach that question than like I think a lot of the ways you hear generally you know out in media. Yeah. So w- when you're in this market right now, that's yeah, we're all thinking a recession's coming. It has you know, like even the housing market I've seen drop pretty suddenly throughout that last uh, quarter three and four, and now we're kind of leveled off, and things are transacting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of buyers in the market and, think, and it's like, oh, okay, the fall has kind of stopped and we're just kind of there now. And which is, I like investing. Uh, you know, I like stability. I actually like stable markets. Like the last two years were a little too nutty for me. But then at, how do you, for what you guys do, how do you mitigate risk? And like, because that's that unknown, right? Like I'd rather invest in deep recession or an appreciation where you can kind of guess and predict a little bit more. But when you have this prediction, you know, like for me, yes, I think a recession's coming. It all says it's on the roll, but we're not seeing it. And you don't want to sit on the sidelines too long. How are you guys, how do you implement these predictions into your investing today with that kind of mindset? Because we're all kind of stuck in the middle right now, but we want to put our money to work. So like when you guys are forecasting, like what, what, what are you guys really looking into? And then how do you actually put that in a tangible use to, to earn in a yield? Yeah. Well, so I think it might be fun to do some scenario planning together, actually. Okay. <laughs> Day by time. I love But like idea. before, like, but to answer, answer your question specifically, like tactically, like what we what we are doing and what we do right now is you you go into credit. So credit actually has been really well priced, and now credit in the bond market has um, rallied a lot. So I, I think I told you about this last time, but like we went into the credit markets starting in the summer, and we started buying asset backed securities, and we were, we've been really active buying different kinds of bonds and busted convertibles, and as, I mean just the credit markets were really really interesting. We were getting like super high yields. And we also started lending as me- like kind of mezzanine debt or rescue capital. And so I I love being in different parts of the market because that gives me sort of a broader understanding of what's happening, not just being in like, you know, if you're when I was just a real estate guy, I, I knew like a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. better than anybody. But like I missed the big picture and I got like hammered by 2008 financial crisis just absolutely like i didn't i didn't see it coming i didn't know i didn't know what a subprime mortgage was <laughs> i relate with this <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i like I, I came away from being like having the big picture is so essential and i get to operate across a lot of different sectors now and that's been really useful as i think about like the tactics down on the ground as you're saying like um what do you do credit 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 and 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 that's starting to go away. It's starting to price like that, that sort of excess yield starting to go away. And then after that, like, I don't know what we're going to do, but I think we have at least another month or two before that happens. Yeah. That's a hard part too. Like in 2008, same thing. I didn't even know what subprime mortgages were, but I knew the market was good. And we were doing a lot of work during that time, had a lot of business going and then it kind of hit us out of nowhere because we weren't looking at the big picture and then as you're trying to invest today, you get this whiplash from 2008, and then you get the memory that you didn't have your eyes up wide open to what was going on, and it kind of locks you up a little bit, where you're like, what's the right move? Yeah, it's paralyzing. Totally. Yeah, we're just slapping every type of mitigation or risk on a deal, and if it hits all these boxes, we're like, okay, we can make that good investment, because we don't... There's been plenty of times I've sat out when I shouldn't, and there's been plenty of times where I dove in too hard when I shouldn't. And so it's like you're trying to find that perfect median and it's, I think that's where we're all at. We don't really know what the next engine is. It's, I guess, whatever opportunity comes in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. I think about, so like the, my first recession or whatever you want to call it was 2001. And I didn't, basically it made almost no impression on me. 
<laughs> like I didn't even, I was just like really young and I was like, oh, it's a recession that I've heard. And like, you know, I just went out with my friends and stuff. So that way, like, <laughs> I feel like if you're depending, like I feel a lot of my people I work at Fundrise with like, that's sort of how 08 hit them. It kind of didn't really leave a big impression because they were just coming out of school or something or, and then for me, the second recession was 2008 and only left like a deep impression on me. Mm -hmm. And and the problem was it left like scars and I sort of overcorrected around it. And so now we're in like, I think the third one, and I'm like, oh, the third one I get now, I'm like, I sort of like was too unconcerned before and I was overly concerned on the second one. And now I sort of have like a really rich understanding in a way that I think it's hard to get without going through three, essentially. And and um, yeah, it's like this sort of self-reflection around like, okay, I feel really uncomfortable, but I'm going to act. Where before I felt really comfortable when things were good and I shouldn't act, right? That's like, it's it's learning to calibrate to your own handicaps, your, your own biases, your own like that emotional state. That's like the, what the third recession, like you'll come out of this one with that. And that's like, you're going to look back and be like, I should have done that deal, but I didn't because I was like freaked out. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe James, you're old enough, but like that's, it's, that's definitely a gift with age. So there's not very many gifts, right? <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> Mostly very sore mornings now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we could talk about credit or we could talk about scenarios or we could talk about something else, whatever you want. Dave wants to go through the I scenarios. I love the idea of scenario. I do because I was writing uh, and filming a YouTube video today trying to explain what might happen with mortgage rates. And I was trying to <laughs> thinking through like, you know, what are the different scenarios or what are the variables at least that will impact mortgage rates over the next couple of years, like year or two. Um and so I was just thinking about that. And I also, I don't know if either of you have ever read the book Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. She's a mm. professional poker player. Love her. Yeah, she's she's phenomenal. Um, and I, I think it's, I, I just love what you said earlier, Ben, about thinking probabilistically. Like that's the only way you can really approach these types of environments. Like no one knows. So you just have to like think about what are the different outcomes? Maybe think about what probability you think, you know, assign some probability to each of them and act because doing nothing, like you were just saying, is not really an option, especially for you, Ben, you know, you have like large assets under management, James, you have big business, like you have to do something. So you need to like think through the scenarios and try and make the best decision you can. So I'd love to learn more about Ben, like what, how would you approach scenario planning? Like given the context that most of the people listening to this are, you know, retail investors, people who are, you know, running a small business, um, like how, how could they go about doing some scenario planning for this economy? Yeah, I love that because I, I learned it and I feel like it really works. It really helps you get out of the sort of like the the paralysis or the, the you know, moment you're in where you, you, you just, you feel like you have to pick a choice. And so, so yeah, so I'll, I mean, and again, I'm, this is not my, I'm just, I, I took this whole cloth from Peter Schwartz. <laughs> and 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 maybe like refined it by doing it. And let me just give you the example of of um, Shell Oil for a second because that's a great example. So they did this scenario planning. They did the three scenarios, and their third scenario in 1987 or something was this crazy scenario. They're like, what if like the Soviet Union fell? What if it collapsed? And like 1987 or 86, whenever they did that scenario, that was like crazy. Like the CIA didn't see it come. No one saw that coming except for Shell. And Shell said, if that happens, this, you know, all these things will happen. You know, we could probably get ahead of it with like very little effort, just like, and they put these, like a few things in motion that that two years later when when Soviet Union fell and, you know, Berlin Wall and everything, right, that they ended up like making like a hundred billion dollars, something like absolutely killed it because they, they were prepared for something that just seemed so outlandish to them at the time and anybody at the time, including like the CIA. And so there's like a lot of power in the, in the scenario planning because it's like, um, yeah, okay. There's a 1% chance of it, which means probably it's actually really easy to like get ahead of that thing. But like the pandemic, right? That 1% thing does happen and it, being prepared for the pandemic or not being prepared or interest rates going up, you know, from zero to 5%, those, the the um 
inflation hedges you could have bought ahead of time were really, really cheap because it was so unlikely. So the th great thing about the, the sort of doing the scenario planning is that the unlikely thing is actually easy to get ahead of early and basically impossible after. So if you take the moment, right, and you say, okay, we, we're at this moment in time where we basically feel like it could go into recession, could, could, or it could not. Those are the two easy scenarios, right? So like, why wouldn't it, or why would it? And you, we spend the time thinking, okay, like, well, why would it not go into it? You know, the, the main reasons in my view, and I'd be interested in, in yours essentially are the labor market stays healthy because there essentially is a demographic shortfall. Like, I think that there's, we've closed off immigration and the baby boomers are finally retiring. And so you end up with like just not enough workers to support like a 300 million person, 350 million person country. And so you have like more demand, but less supply of workers. And that's good for workers. And that's also infl inflationary. And that's, that's one, probably the most likely reason. The other possible one that I feel like I haven't heard anybody talk about is um, productivity. Like the X factor is why they have all these things aren't causing like, you know, inflation is basically real productivity that the pandemic shocked sort of the system and like stir, like sort of stirred it up, like all the sort of static um, complacency, you know, the, Tyler, Tyler Cowan calls it the great stagnation, right? There was this period where just people weren't moving, people were, would stay in the same job, you know, like telehealth, all these things were sort of like stuck. And the pandemic just caused a lot of change and all that change now is being picked up as productivity growth. But productivity growth is extremely difficult to measure. And we won't know it's productivity growth for like until years back. Like the, so like in a way that I think about like, could this be like the 1990s? And if you go back and look at the 1990s, Fed funds were at five and a half. Right, right where we're heading. Like what, right. Yeah, from like, like, so there was a recession at the beginning of the 90s. Like that's why George W, w George H.W. Bush lost the election. Clinton comes in and there's this like, Productivity boom as a combination of technology and also the, the the biggest generation at that time was boomers and they sort of enter into their 30s and 40s in the 90s. So it sounds like the millennials now, right? To have a big generation driving productivity growth, you have technology, and so you have high in, high interest rates but high growth. And people look back at the 90s being this amazing, you know, period of American growth, and and so that's like a possibility. I think we. Most people, including myself, hadn't really deeply considered. And, um, you know, what does that mean for asset prices is like a, you know, you have to, it's a derivative of that scenario. But I, I could, you know, that could be, that could be the case. Like you, you can be persuaded that there's a lot of good things happening in the country and we, that's why we don't have and aren't going to have a recession. Interesting. So, I mean, just for everyone listening, basically, when you talk about economic growth, at least in terms of GDP, there are really two ways to grow an economy. It's right. It's like the number of people working and their productivity. And so because people continue to work and maybe, as Ben is saying, productivity is going up, that is a reason why GDP is going up is continuing to grow. We saw, I think it was at 2.9% annualized rate in Q4. Um, so, you know, by the traditional definition of a recession, which is, you know, two, two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction, we are definitely not in a recession by that definition. And, and maybe this is why. Um, and I just want to also get back to something you said, Ben, which is really interesting, which is that maybe the labor market is so tight because there's just not enough people. Mm -hmm. And that's just like never really happened before. Is that, or, or do you know of any instance where like the economy, you know, had more job? There's just like some slack in the labor market where there's so many extra jobs available that even if the total number of jobs goes down, like it probably has, the unemployment rate doesn't actually fall because it's so easy to replace a job. Is that sort of what you mean? Yeah, like if you if we were doing this exercise like as a business, we would then go off and look for periods where there where that has happened, and we'd try to see like okay, what was happening. So like the first one that comes to my mind, this is like a extreme example, is like Europe in the sort of after World War One or after World War Two. You know, basically a lot of change because everything was destroyed. Like so, they had to build a new manufacturing base. 
like a lot of people like this is something in World War One. Like there was like this a whole generation of men were just killed, gone. So there's just like not enough population available to do the work. So there was so there's like that's an extreme example, but like so I I, I haven't I have to go back and look at like that period, but I'm pretty sure Europe went through a tr- period of tremendous growth. I mean, it started from a really low base because of all of the um, destruction. But and and you'd go back and look at after World War II in the United States as a, maybe a similar parallel. And I think we were also closed immigration for a long time running into that period. So there are p- historical parallels. I mean, you, you need to go spend some time to do a robust. The whole point of the exercise is do the work, right? Really try to find because you're looking for patterns. You have to understand the data to really understand the patterns. And, we, and so you can't get there just from like sitting around. So that's, but, you know, scenario one is something like that, right? That there, and they, I think there's also sort of like one other thing I'm seeing in the market that's also part of the sort of growth story is, is onshoring. We have stuff in Phoenix and we, and, and there's just so much growth happening from the onshoring. I mean, the, the government passed a new industrial policy, which they're going to spend money to bring chips and you know, green power and and infrastructure, they're gonna and it's causing a lot of deficit spending. And you can debate whether that's good or bad in the long run, but it's causing huge growth. I mean, if we have a industrial part of our business and the more industrial today, our industrial portfolio is actually the best performing of all the assets we have. And we just we you know, six months ago we we thought, oh, this is gonna be this is scary, what's gonna happen? And, and instead we're having like leasing way above market tons of tenants want leases like it's not you know everybody said amazon left the market it was going to get bad and instead you know we have had like tsmc which is like a big chip manufacturer in phoenix like they came to us for one of our buildings like really 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 active market so and i think it's because of onshoring that's super interesting so basically th- these combination of things like we're getting Onshoring, meaning pe- jobs are being repatriated, like people are bringing them back to the United States um, that maybe were offshored uh, entire industries, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. chip chip manufacturing comes to mind. Um, you know, this the the reduction of, um, you know, the, the of immigration over the last couple of years um, and the. Uh, yeah, productivity of workers could all be one scenario, right? So mm-hmm. that's why the, mm-hmm. the economy is still growing. What about the other side? Like, you know, we haven't seen a recession yet by a traditional definition, but like, do you do also do scenario planning to think through like what might come down the road that will lead to a recession and try and scenario plan like how deep that recession might be? And right. You know, you own assets and, you know, real estate and so many different asset classes. Like, do you try and forecast how each asset class might be impacted? Yeah. So just to finish scenario one, so you can see that it was mostly an extrapolation of stuff we're already seeing, mm-hmm. right? You're just trying to play that out. And the thing about a scenario I just want to refine here is that it's really like almost like you're writing a book or a movie of the future. Like, it's not just a bunch of data. You want to build a story. And so, Stories are how we actually understand information, not data. Data is not how we understand the world. So, so you want to make it into like imagine like a script. And so, scenario two is it's the story you would tell is something like you know I'm I'm a year from now, and I said what happened actually it turns out is that even though information technology and the internet made you know data move quickly, the real economy still moves slowly. And all those layoffs and all those problems were building up. It just it just took longer for it all to sort of like culminate into a recession. Mm-hmm. And the recessions are vicious cycles. You know, as you cut people, then you buy less stuff, and you buy less stuff, their supplier then has to cut people, and so so it's just a lot slower than we than we imagine. Like in two thousand one. The tech bubble collapses in, two th- in March 2010. Sorry, March 2000 is when the tech bubble c- collapses. Oracle didn't have their down quarter and their earnings miss till one year later. And that's like, doesn't seem that f- disconnected. I don't know. So, so when bad things are happening, everybody's trying to stop them from happening. You're, you're, you're trying to delay the bad thing, kick the can. The lender wants to extend. 
you know, you, you don't want to do the layoff. And so there's a lot of reasons why that it takes a longer time for the down, down to happen. And then you sort of say like, that's what's like sort of a background context. And then in the sort of scenario two, there's some catalyst that causes everybody to sort of break to the negative. And that catalyst could be the government just shuts down for half a you know for half a year or four months because of the debt ceiling and there's defaults and then they cut they cut all social spending and then all of a sudden now all the spending that we thought we were going to have goes away and that's basically like causes a recession and maybe something happens in the world that like unexpected like a, somehow you wouldn't think is connected to it but you know. China decides to sell all their treasuries or I don't know, right? There's just like some strange catalyst that just – that breaks to the negative and then everybody finally says, oh, it's a recession. And then people really start pulling their money out of the stock market. They really stop doing acti- business activity, business risk and, um, and that just sort of starts to feed on itself. And so it's like you point to the catalyst as the reason why it happened. But it's really – it was already happening slowly and it just needed like some narrative shift – that was like it's like what happened. I mean, we just saw this like last year, January thirteenth, I think it was, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Right, we already had inflation. Everything was already like background context was there, but that catalyst really just tipped it to the to the inflationary like market that was was something that was just was all of the last twelve months. And so like that's it's easy to imagine sort of the the the, the inverse of that happening, and you just, and you just. You're not trying to predict the catalyst. You're just trying to tell a story. Imagine a catalyst. And the point of it is that if you can imagine it, you say, oh, well, then I wish I had done these things. Like you're putting yourself into that scenario. So a year from now, this is what's happened. I wish in retrospect I did, you know, whatever it is. I had liquidity for the, this 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 lender, you know, they're going to have – they're going to basically end up in trouble. I better be be ready for to, to like pay them down or what, or whatever the – the things are that like, you look back and say in that scenario, like here's a checklist of things I wish I'd done in retrospect. Yeah, and I feel like in today's market, you just have to like we're having to do that on any kind of deal we're doing. And and like what Ben's talking about is like you can get locked up. You have to find the opportunity that works in your side, your checklist of like here's the predicted – like. And you can – you know, because sometimes when you think about with these big funds and the economy, it gets very – uh, overwhelming, right? Like what it's so like for us, like in our basic day to day, we're just trying to go through a checklist of each deal. What's the risk? What's the predictability? Where do we think rates are going to go? And then what has that typical, what we did know is if rates keep going up, the affordability is coming down. We saw that happen. Uh, we also saw that happen in 2018 mm-hmm. when rates kind of went up a little bit, we saw the market kind of come down a little bit. And so it's just about taking those day-to-day steps because it, it gets so overwhelming with the amount of information. You just kind of go through a predictable checklist per deal that you're looking at or investment engine. And then, you know, and then also go, well, which which part, like in real estate, you know, Ben's in a way bigger field. But like in real estate, you're like, okay, I, at a certain point, an asset class is going to hit the checklist a lot more. And then that's where we shift our focus as investors, at least, you know, like uh, we were talking about we bought a lot more larger multifamily because it's hitting our checklist every time, whereas like fix and flip is only hitting it 50 percent of the time now. And so you just have to kind of predict what's going to happen and, and then really put that into your day to day underwriting. And it, it, it could, you know, m- mitigate the risk that way. Yeah, tactically. Yeah, you're r- r- totally right. What's interesting about like a, a downturn like we're talking about where maybe it's not like 08, maybe it's just like things just. Things don't pencil. There's no growth. Like it's just, it's just like you, you know, it's not gonna a great way to make money in your underwriting. Like you're not likely to lose money either, right? So you're basically, if you're buying in this environment, you know, you're trying to figure out like, okay, do I think this is gonna be profitable? But you're looking at the numbers, you and you've really positioned yourself to protect the downside. And if you've if you've done it right, like especially in this environment, I really think you're just looking at basis. You're not looking at cap rates. You're looking at like. Like we're starting to see, like you can get as a, as credit especially, but you can get in below replacement cost. You know, you're buying something just you're buying it cheap. 
even though on paper it doesn't look like it's going to make money because you can't forecast interest rates, you can't forecast cap rates, you can't forecast rent growth. But man, it's cheap. Like it's not expensive. And so then I, the way I think about it is then like, then it's just about time. It's just like at some point, whether it's five years or two years, like some point, like that will be a good investment. We have a lot of people on our team who used to work at like big financial institutions and they, they like to do, you know, big complex financial models. And I'm like, well, I hate those things. <laughs> Cause they're like, they're, I mean, they're always wrong. And like, they don't, they really like, they told you not to do the deal today and they told you to do the deal in 2021. Right. They just, they over extrapolate the present into the future. And so 2021, everybody over extrapolated high growth. And now they're people are going to over extrapolate low growth. And so there's like, if you've protected the downside, like the upside will take care of itself. But that's not how the model, the model is not contingent. That's what I hate about. This is what we're talking probabilistic thinking. Like you want contingent thinking. Mm -hmm. And then if you, there's a few different contingencies, you don't know which one is going to be, but you have good basis and you have time and you, and you, you're in some, you know, we're in some market where there's like, you know, world will the world will recover. If you look at like Sam Zell or anybody from like the eighties, like when like like I'm obsessed with the nineteen ninety, you know, collapse of the real estate market. And I've actually done like a ton of like interviewing people from that period, talking to people like who worked for the government. So just to give you a sense of how bad that was, basically eight thousand banks were foreclosed on. And then all those banks foreclosed on all the all their borrowers, because basically like you know, you can't get money, so that you, so you, when your loan comes due, you're going to get foreclosed on, and so then the government ended up owning one trillion dollars of real estate, and there was just no money, and all the people like I, I that I like like I've been interviewed like Larry Silverstein, you know, what is he worth? Half of five, ten billion dollars, or Steve Ross, who's from related, worth ten billion dollars. All of them basically were wiped out, like they had like they were bankrupt in 1991. And all of them figured out how to buy in that period. And the people who who survived were people who basically were were able to go back in and buy in that period. And that period was like, I mean, it was so much worse than we're talking about right now. But like, you know, <laughs> at the same time that they were bankrupt, they were they were buying, and it was horrible. It was it was brutal because this is like everybody used to borrow money back then. Like, and the lender, which is in savings and loans and SNL. The loan was structured as a, de a demand loan, which meant that the bank could say, I'm calling your loan at any point. They demand the money back. So when the SNLs got in trouble, they demand, that's the, the, which loans do they call first? They call the good loans first because mm. they know the bad loans aren't going to pay them. So everybody got taken down back then. Like nobody, like the only way you could survive was you could roll up your assets into a public REIT and 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 go public through an upreach structure. And this is like part of my investigative. I, the guy who took everybody public back then, his name's Richard Saltzman. I interviewed him on Friday, just like, hey, I, I got to him. It took me a while to get to him. And I was like, tell me what you happened back then. He created the first private equity, real estate private equity fund in 1990, 1986 or seven with uh, Sam Zell. And, and so like hearing these details, I just, it gives me so much color about like, okay, what are the lessons here and how does it apply now? And what, like, and I asked him about, right, like, what, what do I do now? What do you think I do now? And it, it, so it's, it's looking at the past, like really in detail, like not just like, um, like talking to people who were there, not just reading about it. That is such a good way to really get your mind around the acting right today in this environment. So what's going to get rolled up next? Wait, so Ben, like, so ben what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, I want to get in what that roll up. What scenarios are you playing? Uh, you had that or bad? <laughs> oh, it is scenario three. Scenario three is the hardest one because you got to do something less like, you know, the what's the one percent? You know, like if if we were, did this in 2019 and I said let's do a pandemic. You would have been like that. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, we all learned lessons of that. Yeah, if the pandemic happens again, I'm buying assets in mass droves. I mean, so what's like what's like a one percent chance of happening? But like as a because the thing about probabilities, you have to do the the chance that it happens times the magnitude. It's like expected value, right? Yeah, magnitude is often left out of the like I I have another team and they're like this is a big risk. I was like, well, what's the what's the okay? So you're saying it's a big risk, but what's the downside if it happens? Like we could pay a hundred dollar fine. 
And you're like, well, I don't understand why we're talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, but it's really high likelihood of happening. Uh, like, anyways, it's like a tax thing. So this is a, like a like a black swan event kind of thing, if you've heard that term. Yeah, I, I just so I, at some point now, black swan has become like it almost it lost its meaning becoming because it became so popularized. But just yeah, so people know it's like the idea is like an unexpected event that you can't really forecast. Um, like you, like Ben said, like pandemic is an example, unless you disagree, Ben, I think that's like a tradition, like an actual black swan as it was a, originally, uh, you know, conceived as like something really no one sees coming, but sort of like changes everything. Yeah, d- that's definitely how I define it. But like the Nassim Tlaib who, you know, invented black swan, he'll say that like, it wasn't a black pandemic, wasn't a black swan because some people saw it coming. And so like, I don't exactly and he, I don't exactly know how how like he actually defines it, even though I've read a bunch of his books. And he's like, if you want to figure out like great place to go think about this stuff is, or learn about this stuff is read. Depending on which ones, there's I think the best one is books called Anti Fragile. Mm-hmm. That's my favorite of them. There's, but all of them are good. I I read them all. This is like his he's he's his thinking is very similar to this. It's not as it's a little bit more. Th- theoretical because he's he's a trader and a thinker he's not a a, a business operator doesn't run a business mm-hmm. so his advice like is a little bit harder to apply to someone who's got like you know employees and operations and stuff but um anyway sorry that's a digression so um you know not that their black swan is always a bad thing but like you could say the internet was like a good version of that like no one sort of saw it coming and it caused massive growth ai could be a Mm-hmm. Sort of like, uh, you know, a year ago, we, AI, we, we, I've been laughed out of the room and now like, well, maybe it's actually within this decade, like transformative to American productivity. Like, so that it, it's usually a bad thing. Usually like Black Swan's a bad thing, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. So with all this fork modeling you've done, what's the asset class that you think, it, like, what have you predicted of where you think the opportunities are? Because that's essentially what you're doing. You're going through the models. You're looking at the history. And then that's going to leave you a certain amount of items left over, right? Or assets you were going to want to look at. Where, where, where are you looking? I mean, credit. I mean, talk about what that means. I mean, not the credit basically means lending. And you can do that as a direct lender, like actually be the lender who lends to the building. Or you can do that in the, you know, bond markets. Or you can do that in the sort of aspect securities markets, which is like a, the market where you have to be a large investor. And that's like all sorts of structured things that like like CLOs and lever loan market lever loans and and things that like you I, I I used to read about now I'm like seeing it and I'm like some of the stuff I look at I'm like why does anybody want to buy this oh my god it's horrible <laughs> like I look at the CLO market which I finally got like started seeing the CLO deals and I'm like so a CLO is called a, a collateralized loan obligation which to me doesn't mean anything. I don't know what that means. Good, me neither. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what is this thing everybody's talking about? And so I saw this deal. And it was a big you know, sponsor, a big you know, group. And they gathered up like, I don't know how many, let's say 300 or 500 loans they made to small businesses. And the loans were on average like $2 million loans to like a warehouse that sells like, you know, granite in Montana. And like a... Uh, you know, just all sorts of small businesses that had like, did, did, you know, where they brought $2 million to run their business. And I look at that and, and as a, as a mostly real estate person, I'm like, Oh my God, like, why would I, <laughs> that doesn't seem very attractive to me. Cause that, that granite company, like if they go out of business, like that $2 million goes to zero. It's not like, like who's going to go bother like trying to go get $2 million from hundreds of borrowers. Like that's like a very inefficient process. So it's amazing that that those companies can borrow from securization market through the CLO structure. But I I can't believe that it's uh, attractive. But I I mean, you know, I'm not an expert yet in it. So maybe I'll never be. So it's so like, but there are parts of the market that are just like, uh, really interesting. So I give you I give you one that's not another negative one and I give it positive. So last time we talked about this, this um, office portfolio called this public company called DTLA, downtown LA. And it's a office portfolio of like five or six towers in, in downtown Los Angeles, like gas, the gas tower. And just like these, you know, they call them trophy assets in real estate. And, and um, I can't remember if we, we talked about this 
on the podcast or after, but like, you know, essentially they're part of the great deleveraging their, their loans came coming due their cap rates, their caps, interest rate caps expired. And they like, they defaulted yesterday and like, you know, whatever, a billion dollars of real estate and the whole thing's going to go sort of like into a workout. But what's interesting, that's interesting going and looking at that. It's like a really interesting, um, under, it gives you sort of like a little bit of a, like a glimpse into the future. Cause I think that's going to happen broadly. But like the part that I, I got to see too, is that I could see the bonds underneath of that real estate, the CMBS bonds underneath of that, one of those $350 million towers. And they were still trading at like 94 cents on the dollar. And I'm like, this should be trading at like 32 cents on the dollar. Or I don't even Some of those tranches go to zero. So like the bond market and the real, and like what I think of as the real economy, like there's, they're just so, they're so like the bond market at its points is like so abstracted from real life. That's why it was part of my thesis of great deleveraging is why sometimes it can be so mispriced. So you can, you can go in there and we did and bought like a lot of really good um, bonds because like we could think about it differently. And so we, we've been doing that. So like asset backed securities of, sing, of single family rental, non QM. So like non conforming mortgages where like we just saw a portfolio recently like last week and it's, a bunch of loans and they, and they were all originated in the last five months, five months ago. So that's like September and the average interest rates, 8% on that portfolio. Cause it's like, it was a horrible time to borrow money. So you say like, that sounds like, you know, if a borrower could make it work at 8% in September of last year, like that's probably a pretty good loan there. Those are like, and everybody was underwriting as if the world was going to end. So that's like a different – so there's like parts of the market that are really attractive and um, that's like where I – we're we're and same thing with like um, tech. There's a, a bunch of like busted convertibles they call them. But like they're, they're um, big tech companies that borrowed money back in 2021 and, and you can get like – this went away. But Roblox, which is – you know has a couple billion dollars in debt. So maybe they have like 10 percent debt on the company. And the bond was at eight percent, and you know you can you can take that bond and and lever it at like and so you could that's a fifteen current on like a super low risk credit. You know you can take you can take debt and borrow against debt. That's what the great deleverage is all about. The best way, the only way to really make big money in debt is by levering it. And so levering it when it was two percent, not a good idea. Levering it when it's eight percent, like that sounds pretty good. This is also true with the REITs. Sorry, I'm going on here. But like the REIT market, here's something that's really, really interesting. So we track public REITs, equity, and public REIT debt. And we have a list of the companies we think are good companies. And their bonds are trading at a higher yield than the equity. How does that work? So to take a company like Essex or Invitation Homes or American Homes for Rent, you, the cap rate for those companies are like 4 and a half, 4.75 they used to be they've, they've really rallied in the last 30 days and the bonds are are 5 5.1 5.2 so basically the bond yield is higher than the equity cap rate and so i look at that and say okay well <laughs> either the bond price is too cheap or the equity price is too expensive mm-hmm. cuz you shouldn't be able to get the debt at a at a better yield than the equity that doesn't make sense there's something happening in the market that's not either it's not efficient or like some part of the market's wrong. And I'm going to say, well, I don't know if the equity is is expensive, but <laughs> like, the, like the the bonds, so we're buying that bond. Like that bond is like, uh, I'd bet the bond market's right and the equity market's wrong if I were to, I mean, not just bet, like that's, we're doing that. But seeing that insight of like, you know, I buy that asset as a building I buy that asset as a public re- and I buy that asset as a bondholder or an aspect security. And you can see like along those, that chain where the pricing just doesn't make sense, right? If you can buy the 65% tranche, like you can be at 65% of replacement cost as a lender and get an 8% return unlevered, right? Because your equity is levered too, right? So you could lever your, you could lever your debt and get a 15 or a 12 that sounds a lot better to me than being in the equity and getting a levered five. Right. Yeah. Right. Six. What are you levering into now? Seven, if you're lucky. Wow. So 
you, well, let me just say this. I think most people who listen to this probably are interested in getting into debt, but probably lack, maybe lack the sophistication to do this sort of, and I mean, no offense to anyone listening to this. I also lack the sophistication to do this, uh, to, to like get into that kind of, uh, betting you know i think most people here are like looking at either individual notes or note funds or just you know traditional real estate assets so like i i guess what i'm curious about is like if if people go ahead and do the scenario planning and they they go through in their mind and say like one scenario is things keep going well we avoid a recession one thing is where things break and we go towards recession another one is like really unknowable like how do you get from that for just like an everyday investor? Like, how do you get from that to like, here's what I'm going to do with my money next month? You know, like how, how do you make a plan from those scenarios? In some way though, it's like, it's actually not that complicated. So you have a scenario where you make that investment in that building, things go like, well, you do well, things go poorly, you don't lose money. And if there's a black swan, it's either like really good for you or you've protected yourself from it. Right, right. Right? And so you like, like, if I were to try to do up, this is like hyper local, you know, if you were saying, will Intel put a $50 billion factory in Columbus, Ohio? Like, I'm going to buy there, there's a 1% chance that happens. And then I'll buy it in a way where my leverage can basically withstand a black swan, or, you know, like a, a down market. And then if if everything goes well, you know, I, I could basically have like three ways to play it out. Like, so you can just apply those three scenarios to the investment and basically the, in the downside, you just want to make sure you, 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 you know, you're not going to make money on the downside. That's, that's not realistic, but you're not going to lose money or, or you can basically you know, weather the storm. And then you said, okay, I'm, I'm good. I can basically act. So basically like as long as your downside is breaking even, right? You're treading water for a little bit, something like that, where you can withstand the the scenario where things break. Then, you know, your worst case scenario is, is you tread water for a little bit, but you've put yourself in a position to capitalize on the other, you know, at least one of the other scenarios and potentially the third scenario, depending on which way it breaks. Yeah. I mean, for me, as I like exist in a world where I'm expecting everything to go wrong, always, just business wise or just always? <laughs> I mean, it's like kind of a personality and kind of like from, from my experience, like a lot of things, I mean, the pandemic, if that didn't teach everybody that like a lot of things can go wrong all at once, right? That, mm -hmm. But if you can get to a place where like, okay, well, like I'm prepared for that scenario, then you can just have a lot of confidence. You can act. You're basically swinging for base hits, hoping that one turns into a home run because of whatever event. So it's like you're... Yeah, I mean, and that because you can shift that, right? I mean, that's where we're seeing like the demand from investors right now too. They want flips or small. They want cheap properties just in case they can break even on them later. It's like, and that's where kind of everyone's going. And if it, you know, and we kind of rush to buy a bunch of properties like that too, because if the market does rebound, then we got nine base hit deals out there that can turn all into doubles, triples, and home runs. And it's it it, it can make a big impact. I, I think like chasing a home run right now is a dangerous thing, though. You, you don't don't swing too big. Totally. So, I mean, and that's something like this is like I always say where the tortoise, not the hare. Like I'm all about singles because the thing about it is that like the way the world works is you that when you hit one of those singles, sometimes like just zoop, it just shoots out of out into outer space because you just mm -hmm. didn't predict that like you know they'd open a Whole Foods next door or some big company decided to buy that asset. Like it's 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 not predictable in a way that like sell models like pretend that it is. And the point of the singles is just like, you just want to have like a lot of like, if the option price is priced at zero with a single, right? It's like, if you hit enough singles, like one of those will be a home run. But if you're just waiting for that home run pitch, probably you'll never have it. And if you do, you're not going to be a good hitter because you just haven't been out like doing the reps. That's so, that's so true. Yeah, I think that that's that's a really good point. Like if you... If you never swing, you're just never going to have the opportunity to even get the ball in play or to take advantage of what happens. You know, the, the, just the natural things that happen in an economy that you can't participate in if you're just on the sideline the entire time. And the people who get the home run 
options are the ones who are in the market. They see that you bought five houses in a row and they call you up they're like, hey, I'm going to do this thing that's really ill-advised. It seems like you're like active in the market <laughs> and, you're, and I'm going to like, you know, do this. I'm going to sell you this deal because I just, you know, I, I need basically somebody who I know is going to close. Mm-hmm. Like I'm looking for certainty and I saw you just cl- close five singles. So you just get way more opportunity by being in market. Like it's it's just the like you, the predict the home run or the white swan or whatever the the the, the outsized opportunities. In my experience, like all the great things we've done, they didn't happen by on purpose. They happened by accident. Now we were in the right place and we we're doing the right thing. But like you know, like for example, for Funrise, I raised a Series A from this guy who wrote a twenty seven million dollar check to us, like a clean round, just incredible terms. And he just came out, he was like, he came into the office. I was like, I don't know who this person is. <laughs> he liked my dog. I chatted with him for an hour and he's like, and he's like, just offered me like basically a blank term sheet. And I was just like, so there's no way I would ever have forecast that in my life. You know, Hey, we're, we're going to raise a series A in you know, two years from now. And here's like, that was just unpredictable. But if we hadn't been like, you know, we hadn't launched the company, we hadn't been in market, we hadn't basically been doing it, we wouldn't have gotten the shot. Totally. It's like thinking probabilistically, right? Like if one of a hundred of those, you know, meetings might turn into your your grand slam, you need to take a hundred meetings. And, uh, you know, that's that's easier to say about a meeting than it is about purchasing real estate. But the idea is still the same there. Right. And you couldn't predict which of those hundred is going to be that one. And, and trying to is like a... It's thinking about the world the wrong way. It just it's nonlinear. The world works nonlinearly, and and our forecasts are usually linear. Yeah, it's it's like uh you know like dating people. A lot of people say it's like a numbers game. Like if you want to meet someone you're compatible with, you got to go on a lot of dates. You know, <laughs> like you don't know which one's going to be the right one, but you just go on a lot of them, and then ultimately you might find the 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 proverbial uh, home run. I think that's uh, it's very very sound advice and. James and I were on a show a couple of weeks ago. We were talking to a couple of former NFL players and we were saying that, you know, personally for me, like I like to forecast or, or underwrite deals with very pessimistically because it puts me in a position where if I'm wrong, it's great. You know, like if I'm, if I'm right, so be it. Like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll eke out a, a return, but if I'm wrong, then you're just happy to be wrong because you you actually wind up to see something that has much more upside than you originally intended or, or thought possible. Yeah. Our team had a sort of consistent mistake in the way they underwrote. And we, we used to do, we were doing a lot of this pref mez investings back sort of after 08. We did, we've done 77 pref deals or it was like 78 because we didn't close one. So we've done a lot. And, and we were getting like 12, 13, 14% yields. And so we were really happy because we looked at the equity analysis and we said, they're not going to make more money than us. But where they were wrong is they, they priced the, the volatility at zero, the option value at zero. So the thing about equity is that sometimes it's just, it, it goes up in value more than it should. It goes up and you're like, what the hell is going on here? Why is that person, why is Starwood willing to pay me a three cap? Like that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> Take it. Yeah, but but like, and this is not in the model, and so that that the value of this sort of like this one percent is is um, then mostly how most I mean like big money is made is and it's just it's I I, I hate Excel because I hate Excel as a as a because it it becomes how we think it be, the medium becomes the message if you if you know the reference and so totally it overly constructs the way the future works. And it just doesn't work that way. And so the underwriting becomes the decision rather than like a, like a support of the decision. That's, that's a really good point. I do feel personally attacked because I love Microsoft Excel so much, but uh, <laughs> I get what you mean. It's so true. Like, like you said, it's like about a story, a holistic story about underwriting. It's not just like, you know, we put together these, these models and like models are all well and good, but they're a function of the assumptions that you put into it. And assumptions come from very flawed humans who probably have the right intentions and best guesses. But the, a lot of times their guesses are based on historical precedent that doesn't turn out to continue into the future. Um, 
And I also just wanted to recommend a book. If anyone, uh, Ben mentioned something about, you know, the 1% of outcomes really driving returns. There's a great book I just listened to called uh, the, Phil- the Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I don't know if anyone's uh, listened to that. It's really like very easily understandable, but he talks about that, like how, you know, he does this whole study of the stock market, but it's applicable to real estate as well. We're just like, you don't know, like even the best investors of all time, you know, these legendary stock investors, like you, if you look and break down their portfolios, it's like they had a couple of wins and they just let it compound for a really long time, you know? And so it's similar to real estate where it's like, as long as you can, you know, stay above water and continue to like do pretty well, something's probably going to hit. You don't know which one, but like you have to have enough, you know, skin in the game to, to be able to take advantage of that, the, those once in a lifetime, well, not once in a lifetime, the 1%, like you said, just taken off. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, I would just add one additional piece of the equation when that, when that 1% comes along. Cause I, I find that when you find the thing that's like, Whoa, like this is like not normal. Like you, you know, <laughs> right? Like I had a deal. I've had only a few deals in my life where I'm like, oh my God. I, I, like I, I bought a deal in 2010 before Fundrise. And I was like, and I just, you knew it was a good deal. And so this is something they say about, um, in the, in the among traders, George Soros is like a famous trader. And they say he wasn't right more frequently than everyone else. But that when he was right, he made huge bets. Mm. And so it's like, it's like when you hit, see that pitch, that's like, oh my God, this is like, this is a good pitch. You just put a lot behind it. And that's the magnitude part of it. It's not just about the frequency. It's about the magnitude. And most people focus on how, how likely it is. I'm like, well, how likely it is, is only half of the equation. That's a really good point. Um, all right. Well, we've kept you for over an hour, so I do think we have to get out of here. But this was a lot of fun, Ben. Thank you. I mean, uh, I I love this idea of scenario planning, and especially in this type of volatile market, like it's really a great idea on how to make decisions. Um, it's just to understand that no one knows, and sort of to play out in your mind or write it down on a piece of paper, like the different things that could happen. And make sure that the decisions you're making are viable um, in in those scenarios. Um, what was the name of that book again? Just in case anyone wants to to read it, it's by Peter Schwartz. I think it's called The Art of the Long View. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I googled it. it that that is that's what I thought. Okay, great. It is the yeah the Art of the Long View. I will put a, a link to that in the show notes. Um, well, Ben, thanks for being here. Is there anything else you think our our listeners should know? No, this is so fun. This is like much deeper conversation than I normally see people have it's like it's really you guys are really fun to talk to well that's good oh well thanks man we appreciate that likewise we look forward yeah i think uh the dangerous thing is it's it's easy to burn through we might have to make like a four-part series on a couple of these episodes (laughs) (laughs) this is gonna be an audio (laughs) book all right well ben miller ceo of fundrise thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again soon for on the market thanks ben yeah thanks guys All right, James, what do you think? I, I think I, I have some homework to do when yeah. <laughs> after this. Were you also Googling stuff Ben was talking about to try and understand? Oh, yes, for sure. You know, <laughs> and it's and it all comes down to the same core principles. We're all trying to predict how to make money. But it's when you're talking about that kind of money and that kind of, you know, range of asset classes, it gets a little confusing. And Ben's a very smart guy. So you're like, oh, I was definitely Googling terms, writing things down, going, what, what <laughs> like, question mark. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. I mean, he's just at a, like at a level of fu- understanding of like finance and some like financial engineering stuff that I just don't understand. But I do think like the stuff he was talking about with scenario modeling, I just love, I love it so much because it really represents at least the way I personally think. And just think that thinking probabilistically is like the only way to be a good investor. Like if you think like, oh, this, you know, the economy is 100% going to do this. Like, that's not true. You don't know that. No one knows for sure. So you have to really think about all the different scenarios that could unfold and prepare yourself. And that way, honestly, for me, if I like take a loss, 
but I thought about the fact that there could be a loss in the future. Like it doesn't sting as much because I'm like, okay, I understood the risk. Like I understood that that could happen. And I made the decision, the best decision I could at that time. Um, and I just think like it's such a wise way to start thinking, especially in this type of volatile economy. Yeah, and that's how we invest in 2008 when the market was in free fall. It was just like, all right, we had to buy this. And if the market dropped X percentage, we were predicting that in there and we over predicted it was like we weren't losing ever on deals then it was like we barely made money but then like you said if you spread your chips out then we'd hit a good one and it's like so just predicting spreading your chips in a safe way and then looking for all upside at that point yeah absolutely i i think it's awesome uh, that was really i i really like talking about that and love the conversation at the end where we we're kind of just saying like what what you just said you got to spread your chips out like you have to be in the game and I, I really recommend that book if anyone wants to listen to the psychology of money talks about how like that's how almost all investors like really make it big over the long runs is they spread their chips out and like something hits and they don't know exactly what it's going to be. But they, you know, they are consistently in the game and they play a little bit defensively so that they don't like you said, like they don't lose money on these deals, but they give themselves the opportunity for upside. So definitely check that out. Sweet. All right. Well, this was a long one, so we'll get out of here quickly. James, where can people find you? Uh, best way to get a hold of me is, uh, honestly, is on Instagram, jdaneflips, or you can check us out at jamesdaner.com. If you love property walkthroughs, definitely follow James on Instagram. They're so good. I love watching them. Dude, that farmhouse you flipped, I want to live in that house. It looks so cool. So do I. That's why I'm like, I'm not in a rush <laughs> to sell it. I'm like, I like it. I was like, if, if no one buys this, this is going to be my house in Seattle. I'm in town. It's, it, oh, it's awesome. It's so dope. Yeah. And I'm not even a farmhouse guy, but I, because it's on a farm, I, I'm digging it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So yeah, check out James, J. Dane Flips on Instagram. I'm at the Data Deli. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you for the next episode of On the Market. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal. And a big thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies. <laughs>